Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Parasite Podcast, and this is a show, as I said in the first episode too, where I kind of turn the spotlight around. I know a lot of people have been following me and listening to me, hearing me talk about Venom for 500 plus episodes now, and I figured, you know what, it's time to involve you guys more. I mean, before I used to read your comments and reply to them in videos to involve you, but now we're going to do something different, and I'm going to reach out to people who either A, are hardcore viewers of the show and have a lot to say about Venom, um, or B, people like the guest I have today, who was just nice enough to have me on their show, and I want to pay that back. And he also has a very unique, uh, you know, perspective on Venom. And remember, everyone, like that's what this point of the show is: is to get different perspectives. Some people might like Venom, some people might not like Venom, some people might, you know, in this case, find them a little scary. So we're gonna have a lot of fun talking today and getting to know our friend Jacob. Jacob, thank you so much for being here. Hi. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much, Nick, for having me on. It's great to be back talking to you again. I truly enjoyed our last conversation, which is up on my YouTube channel, Jacob Elyashar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. It's been, it's been a minute since we last spoke. It's true. And uh, and thank you for uh, saying your last name, Elyashar. Uh, you have a great show, by the way. Uh, I've been catching up on it. And uh, for those of you who want that link that he just said, I will put it in the description box below. Check out Jacob's stuff. Please subscribe. He's got great interviews, and we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of content he creates, and then we're going to get into the Venom stuff. So first, I want to start and and tell the the very romantic story of how we met, Jacob. <laughs> how did we meet? All right, let's do it. All right, so we met. I actually we have a mutual guys for those of, for Parasite Vlogs for those for those of you who don't know. We actually met through a mutual friend. I actually interviewed a guy named Wes from Thinking Critical, probably one of the best comic book industry YouTube channels. And we actually sat on a panel together when he, after he and I, after Wes and I chatted for my podcast, he and I, he invited me on to sit down and that's where I met Sick. That's right. And, uh, and yeah, it was pretty fun because Wes has been a great guy and I don't know how he came across me, I think maybe I left a couple comments in some of his videos, but out of nowhere one day, he was like, hey man, I kind of like the cut of your jig, like, would you like to come on my show? And I'm like, All right, really? I'm like, dude, I love your show. Like, uh, it, I feel like he does really great analysis stuff, and he breaks down things really well, and he brings on very interesting people like yourself, and luckily after being on the show once or twice, he invited us on a panel together where you and I were kind of the odd men out in that situation. <laughs> Oh, uh, we well. Here's the thing: we were all talk. They were talking about the industry and the comic industry and how they're restarting and how they're reformatting. And I'm more, I'm more of the type of the about the books, about the characters, about the creators, and also the co the conventions as well. Like I already knew what was going to happen with San Diego Comic Con, so I felt like a burnt, like a bat, like. Like, like a fish out of the water, basically. But at the same time, I'm grateful that I had you, that we were able to play off each other and also work well together with their, their guests, especially when, especially when Wes's technology kind of went left when he accidentally left us for because of his technology. <laughs> yeah, Wes, uh, he is you know streaming and, and reporting and stuff from the Philippines, so it, you know it gets. He says sometimes the internet goes out there and it gets a little rocky, and and so uh, so yeah, when that happened, you t you kind of took the lead and you were like, all right, well since most of these people in this chat are talking, they're, they're retailers and they're talking about things from a retail perspective and you and I just didn't have a ton to add. We did, we mainly had the fan perspective to add. And once we got that out of the way, you and I kind of felt like odd men out. And so we were like, so then you were like, Oh, well I'll, I'll take over and kind of navigate the ship while Wes is away. And I thought you did a great job jumping in and doing that. And, and after that we started talking and then you were like, Hey, you sent me a nice invite to come on your show, and I had a blast, man. I, I rarely talk about myself in the way that you, uh, you know, kind of led me in your show. And I did another show that same week that allowed the same thing, and it, it felt really good because I haven't talked about myself like that in a long time. And so it was, I think it was kind of cool for some of my viewers to go check out your show and, and hear a different side of me for once. So thanks for giving me that opportunity. You're so welcome, Sick. And here's the thing. It's actually, your video, if I remember correctly, is still growing with the views. And I hope to get it over to, like, maybe triple, maybe quadruple the amount soon. Awesome. This guys, but, like, the thing is, I, re I really enjoyed our conversation. And I think we not just talked about how the impact of what you have comics has had on you, but also how the character and how you your passion behind Venom. 
And that's what I appreciate because Venom and I have, that, like I've said to myself, sometime I lo- I'm testing out my, when I'm testing out my audio, I said for today, I said, I'm going, I'm testing out my audio to go on Venom blog. But however, Ven and I don't get along at all. <laughs> yeah, let's. So now that we've gotten to know you a little bit, and we'll and we'll dive, we'll go back and forth and get to know you a little bit more. But let's uh, let's also talk a little bit about Venom. You say you you have kind of a, a a little. There's a little tension there in that relationship, and I'm just curious because, like I said, this show we mainly talk about how much we love Venom. But I love hearing other people's perspective of the characters, and I know you. And you'll explain more. But I know you like the character, but there's something about him that is unsettling to you, and I'd love to hear that. It's all about the look, and I have to give these artists, like starting with Mark Bagley and Tom McFarlane, credit. I wish they, I wish they kept it the like what they had in 1980s, and not add more monstrous features because that's what terrifies me. And I'm being upfront about it. And like the the evil teeth, the big eyes. Um, it kind of creeps me out. Like when I see Instagram stuff of like, and then all of a sudden the venoms and venoms. Venom version, Venom Pie version of all these characters. I'm like, okay, that terrifies me. <laughs> On Instagram, it's I, the artwork. I, that the artwork, and I have to give the artist credit. But however, please, that kind of scares the hell out of me. And actually, the, when I I was actually looking back on it, when I saw Amazing 298 when Venom made appearance, and then he smiled, that kind of terrified terrified me when he scared Mary Jane Watson. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a creepy moment. And uh, and this is one of the reasons I when. I was on your show. You told me that. You told me that Venom visually scared you, like genuinely scared you. And I said, you know, that I got to have you on the show for that reason because I, when I worked at a comic store, I heard that a lot, but mostly it came from parents who, like, they would come in and they'd have, like, their five-year-old kids, you know, like sons or daughters. And uh, and this one instance, like, these, this mom and her son came right, after, right out of church and they came over to uh, the comic store I was working at and they were like, hey, uh, the, the, the kid was, like, staring at this poster of venom and the mom was like get away from that that's that's evil that's creepy and he's like mom i like it it looks cool and (laughs) and and so when you told me like yeah i find the guy creepy i'm like you're not alone in that like granted you're not alone Uh, i think a lot of us uh you know who do this show especially we love the look of venom we love the the teeth and stuff we kind of embrace that you know body horror weirdness and alien look to him but i totally get where you're coming from and that's why i wanted you to say that here on the show is so people can see that there are people People out there with that perspective and and so you said it's it's the look but is there besides like the teeth and all that is his motion like what really gets under your skin when you think about the character um basically it's basically he's this legendary stalker like yeah. in the com- in the comics in the 1990s and 2000s what i remember him is always was hounding spider always hounding peter parker no matter what terrified not to mention introducing himself to Aunt May, which is like, you don't, Al, Aunt May is like Alfred Pennyworth in my book. You don't touch those characters. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone goes after those characters, they're definitely crossing a line, that's for sure. Yeah, because the thing is, that kind of, like, here's the thing, Venom, what made Venom unique is that he was like, he was like Bane and Rachel Ghoul, the only two people that rem- now knew Batman's identity. It's like, it's like Norman, like ben, Eddie Brock and Norman Osborn were the only two people that knew Peter and, okay, Harry Osborn, three, the only three people <laughs> sure. that knew Spider-Man's identity. And that kind of terrified me because this is a character who's very, who, yeah, who, yes, Peter rejected, rejected the symbiotes, but at the same time, he also, Peter also did a bad thing with Eddie Brock as Eddie Brock claimed that Parker dis- destroyed his journalism career. Yeah, I mean, kind of indirectly, but but absolutely, and and so there is there's a little justification on Eddie's end in in a in a slightly extreme way, but I feel like that's why he garnered the fan base that he did was because people were like, you know, you know, Spider Man didn't mean to ruin this guy's career. He didn't he didn't set out to catch the Sin Eater to ruin Eddie Brock's career. That wasn't his goal, but it is a an effect of him catching the bad guy. It had a ripple effect. And and so I think some people were like, okay, I may not agree with Venom, but I understand him. And having that understanding, I think, is uh, that understanding is what led to the character getting to be so popular. Yeah, and here's the thing. I respect Venom. I still, in our previous conversation, I said the top three, the top three Spider-Man villains of all time, Norman Osborn, Green Goblin, Dr. Otto Octavius, and then Eddie Brock Venom. Those are the, tri- the unholy, tr- unholy trinity. 
<laughs> yeah, they are. And, and it's funny uh, that you say that too, because yeah, I was talking to a friend yesterday about that. They were like, who are Venom's, what, I mean, who's Spider-Man's like number one villain? And I said, well, it's funny if you, if you ask a, like a mainstream person who doesn't maybe read comics or maybe read a couple when they were a kid, if you ask them, chances are they're going to tell you Venom is. And, uh, and that's what we were talking about, how Sony kind of maybe underestimated the first movie a little bit because, uh, they, you know, before they released it, like they were ready to release it and they're like, hey, we're making a Venom movie. So they, they know the character's popular, but I think they underestimated a little bit of how popular because that movie made almost a billion dollars. And, uh, and that's because I think the character is a household name that most people know who Venom is, whether they read comics or not. Most people have either saw the Spider-Man cartoon in the nineties, or they've seen a couple of drawings of his, or they just know who the, or they saw Spider-Man three and liked it, you know, when they were younger, whatever it is, you know, uh, people really gravitate to that character. So yeah, when you told me you're afraid of him, I'm like, that's great because uh, that's what he was initially created to be was this agent of fear. Yeah. And here's the thing. I, like when he did the Spider-Man, that was when I, every time I look at Venom, I try to look away. I look away when Venom pulls up on the on the Spider-Man animated series introduction. Yeah, <laughs> when he like so swallows Peter Parker whole when the symbiote, not just not Venom, but like with the symbiote. Oh, that kind of terrifies. Me. That's like a force of evil. Okay, so oh, that's a good specific thing we can talk about. Um, but let me let's talk about it in a minute because now I want to backtrack a little bit um, and talk about. You know, kind of what you do, because like you know, like we, we're talking a lot about what I do and, and the venom and everything like that. But but I do want to back uh, bounce back and forth and and uh, and and say like you know you you do have passions. You are a big comic book fan. So it's taking a step away from venom for a second, and we'll come back to the giant symbiote nightmare sequence because I really love that scene. Uh, but uh, what kind of brought you into comics? You know, well, that's a good place to to start before we get into the next round of venom stuff. All right, so what started me in comics was actually watching what was actually watching the Batman the animated series and then Spider Man the animated series and the X Men the animated series during the classic nineties heyday. Those story seeing those, those characters, I fell in love with Batman, I fell in love with the X Men and with Spider Man. The first comics I got were actually the Batman animates and Robin animated adventures because I was too young enough to go and mature and read those stories. But when the first, however, I started reading those story, the mature titles, when Batman Hush started back in 2002, that was my very first mature title was Batman Hush. So it was Batman and then followed by the X-Men. I had at the time a candy X-Men, Mike A. X-Men, the regular X-Men, and also Astonishing X-Men had those three titles, but then I started to discover that Batman and the X-Men were not just the great heroes outside the world. That's when New Avengers started popping up. Brian Bendis' first launch when Spider-Man, Wolverine, Captain America, Spider-Woman, Luke Cage, all that. That was when I started picking up the Avengers. Over on, DC, over on DC side, I got Justice League because Batman was part of it, and then I grew because of the this infinite crisis was coming, and I wanted to be, be able to be prepared on it, and I able, was able not just to look at the books, but I also got Action Comics, the first, the original Superman's title, and also I got Justice League, then there was Justice League, then there was Justice Society, and then Teen Titans, and then that's how I, my comics began, because it all started with one character for me, and that was Batman, and now look at, and right now, I'm looking at, even though I live in New York, and I don't have a lot of money for comics, it's always the characters of Batman the X-Men and Justice League and the Avengers that always carry with me. I always buy those issues. Man, that's that's awesome. I do always tell people Batman is a great gateway drug to comic books. Uh, he's mm -hmm. He's got something for everybody, and uh, whether it's a psychological thing or you just like the action or just the physical look of him or the character understanding his tragedy, like there's so much going on with that character that he is a great gateway. And that show, you're right, the 90s, like I... I feel because I uh, the other day I was calling people not in a bad way, but I was saying like how how amazing it must be to grow up in the era of Marvel movies. If like let's say you were ten years old when Iron Man came out, and you're like twenty now, um, or tw you know twenty two now or something, like I, that's pretty amazing that you got to grow up in that era where you just got you know these all these big fun movies out there. I go that's very 
amazing for this generation and I feel like they're very spoiled in that regard. I go, but then again, I think about our generation and I think that we grew up with three of the best cartoons ever with Batman, X-Men, and Spider-Man. And uh, so much so that are still so good that even younger generations today who watch these newer cartoons are like, yeah, but it's not as good as the 90s one. And it's like, well, no, of course not. Because the 90s one had the the awesome you know, ability to, uh, they had nothing like Spider-Man had the electric company and they had like Spider-Man's amazing friends and Batman had the Adam West show and the Tim Burton movie kind of, but it didn't have like real true interpretations of these characters. I mean, minus the Tim Burton movie that obviously kickstarted the, the TV show, the cartoon, but, uh, but you know, the other, the Adam West stuff, like a lot of those were campy and kind of representative of the times people in the nineties, they wanted things that were very accurate to the comics and you just named the three shows that are so accurate that everybody today is like, oh, why can't they do this with Doc Ock and do that? And it's like, because they did that in the 90s show and you can't repeat it. So just go back and watch the 90s show because it's amazing. <laughs> and that's and all. Not to, oh, and go not ahead. to mention, sorry to interrupt, but the yeah. cast of that show. Yeah. Amazing. It's like for all those shows, we had Mark Hamill on both, of the, on both Spider-Man and Batman as the show, as the hero's top two villains. That's Joker true. and Hobgoblin, respectively. Uh, and not yeah. only that, you had people like Efren Zimbalist Jr. as well that gone from good with Alfred Pennyworth to bad with Doc Oct- Doctor Octopus. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it had a it had a great cast and uh, and so and then Roscoe Lee and sorry Roscoe Lee Brown's Kingpin probably uh, one of the greatest animated villain performances of all time. Amen. That's okay. You're, yeah, that's I'm glad you squeeze that in. You're right. He's so good as Kingpin. Um, so with that said now, um, let's. Let, how did that lead you, like, you know, being a comic fan, you, you got back in, you were reading Hush, you started getting into New Avengers and all these really great books that were coming out in the early 2000s and you kind of got sucked in back in that way. So how do you go from that into, you know, what you do now? Because you create some really unique content now that, yes, you are comic book, you know, you love comics and you have stuff that, you know, speaks to comic fans, but you also do other things about, you know, uh, different TV shows that are online and you, you reach out and talk to the, the stars of those shows. Like, how did you get into that? And what are some of the projects and, uh, and things you work on so that the audience listening can maybe go seek, you know, seek that out? All right. So it all started back at Blue Valley North, back watching when I was growing up. It was the cool, it was the last of the great reporters generation. We had Dan Rather, Ryan Dan Brather, Peter Jennings, and Tom Brokaw with the news. Plus, you all have still had Katie Couric in the mix, and Barbara Walters still active. I wanted to be like them and interview the most important people, wherever it was, the President of the United States or Oprah Winfrey at the time. I, ra- I wanted to be those people that told those stories and do those inter- and conduct those interviews. So that's what I went to school for. I, I had a passion back at, when I took my class at high school with broadcast, with broadcast, introduction to broadcasting, I took that, I did that, and however, it wasn't until high school with journalism, I fell in love with it, and actually went to University of Colorado to pursue a career in journalism, and actually, that led me, that led me to write for the CU, the CU student newspaper for three years, and then also be on CU Sports Mag, and also be in Boulder, but also intern at three different Affiliates, affiliates, affiliates of ABC and NBC in Denver, and then Fox in Kansas City, my hometown of Kansas City. By the time I graduated high college, it was 2011. It was the height of the Great Recession. So I, and also I was horrified to look at the way entertainment journalism was going on with Harvey Levin at TMZ and Perez Hilton dragging it down the drain. So I decided to take my background and create my own platform, Jake's Take, or and the website is Jake's Take jakes-shake.com and showcase my love of entertainment and all things journalism and I'm just so grateful that I never thought in my wildest dreams I would be on a phone line with three other with almost two dozen reporters talking to Cindy Lauper or talking to Dolly Parton or to late Kenny Rogers or even talking to people or even going into the producers auditions for America's Got Talent when they visited Kansas City in 2016 or going on the set of American Ninja Warrior when they went to Kansas City as well. But also not to mention seeing, talking to people that want Survivor, to talk to people that were on American Idol, America's Got Talent, and Big Brother, and a challenge, it's, and Dancing with the Stars, and so you can dance. God, I'm just very lucky that I was able to do that. And I decided back in 20, 
19 to start doing the podcast because I knew the media was moving towards podcasting. And if I didn't showcase my interviews and showcase what I was able to do sick, then I'd be in a dust. You know, I, I love in there that you mentioned, you were like, I got really lucky, but after, you know, and I, and I do, I, I, I looked up, you know, kind of after being on your show, like, oh, I got to learn more about this guy. And I try, you know, try, I, I like doing research. That's my favorite thing is I like doing research. And, uh, Me too. And I what and you say oh I'm I, I'm lucky I got here and that's very awesome that you feel that way but it's it sounds like to me and from the research I've seen that I've done on you uh, yeah I hope that doesn't creep you out but it's it shows me that you maybe yeah you're a little lucky but you are you earned it like it, it, you may may see it that way you may not but. Uh, you earned all these like all these great things that are happening to you your platform growing you know you're getting the website the jake's take like and again i'll put that uh link down below for everyone listening um you know jake does some really amazing things and you can hear it in his voice he he loves journalism and that's another reason why i wanted to talk to you more than just the venom stuff is that in a way you're like a real life eddie brock like eddie brock had a really uh deep passion for journalism and because he just had one thing mess up it, it kind of ruined his life and we see that a lot nowadays and like you said there are people out there like Perez Hilton and stuff like that in the early 2011 around that area uh, where uh, you just were watching and you're like I don't like this type of content I, I want to do something that is a little bit more true as far as the traditions of journalism and you cared so much that you were like that's the platform I'm gonna attack you already knew that kind of before but seeing how other people do things and you're like I don't like this I'm going to pursue my way and and kind of hold on to the values of journalism. That is why I think you're getting all these great interviews and you're and you're growing in the way you're growing is because you have a passion for it. So yeah, maybe a little luck. A luck always helps out in a lot of instances, but you want it. And uh, and and honestly, you make really great content, man. If if you don't mind me gushing about you for a few seconds, like you're uh, you're you're a very they, passionate they, dude. You make great content too because seriously, I and commend you the way that you have almost the Sony Cinematic Universe, the smart, the Sony Cinematic Universe have an eye on you with Venom blog. And like, seriously, Tom Hardy knows your blog. Half the major players in the Venom franchise know your blog. That means a lot. And I commend you for that. It's not just me. That's going to be gut. Not just you. That's going to be gushing. I got to gush about you for, for what you've been up to. Well, that's fine. I, that's, I appreciate you wanting to do that. But this, this, this is me talking to you. Um, but, uh, but that's very nice of you to say. It, it is. But I think that's why I like your content too. Is because I, it, I feel like, oh, that's kind of what I set out to do. I saw what other YouTubers do, and I was like, yeah, I don't really like what some other YouTubers do. So I'm gonna try to make my content a certain way. And I found someone probably like you did, and I'd love to hear who that inspiration was. But because uh, you said Dan Rather and, and those guys, so that's great that you had those inspirations. And I, I want to hear more about that. And same with me. I, I saw a guy on YouTube named The Raging Nation. And he talks about Transformer movie, the Michael Bay movies, and that's easily a franchise that a lot of people hate <laughs> for sure. But uh, but he he had such a passion for it, and he didn't mind the negativity, and he rolled with it, and he understood it. But he was still Mister Positive about everything, and he only reported details that came out that were from you know high end sources. He didn't go off rumors, he didn't do leaks or anything like that. And he set the bar for me, and and that's when I was like, that's the kind of content I want to make. And then luckily that led me to guys like Wes, who then led me to people like you, who are the same. You know, I feel like I see that in you. You're just like, I want to make the stuff that the people inspired me to make. So those people who did inspire you, was there anything specific that they did that you try to emulate in the way you present uh, content now? For example, I want to look when I look at the interviews. I look at the gold standard of interviews when it comes to celeb when it comes to like the people. If, if it's an investigative approach, I'll use my hard hatting to pull out the 60 minutes Mike Wallace one if it comes to an, if I have to meet with an intense person. But like at the same time, I'd rather be more of a Barbara Walters approach when it comes to that. And also with Nancy O'Dell and Ke Nancy O'Dell, Kevin Frazier, and then, and then of course the legendary entertainment entertainment tonight duo, Mary Hart and Mark Steinis. I watch I watch those guys a lot because I, when I saw those interviewing those key celebrities, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be able to see, like they were able to like spring in, mix in the professionalism with a little bit of the personal. But then of course there's also people who are entertainers that match my personality, like the legendary Regis Philbin. I was the devout viewer of Live with Regis and Kathy Lee and with Regis and Kelly. 
And those in that show means everything. And also seeing Rosie O'Donnell growing up, growing up when she was popular and watching the, I remember when she actually had Barbara Walter, or not Streisand, not Walters, Streisand, mm-hmm. one of her life inspirations. And she was cannot holding back her tears and saying, this is for all the boys and girls where dreams do come true. Please welcome Barbara Streisand. That meant that, okay, if I worked it hard enough and I can get my the, my ultimate people to come on. I believe that too, man, and I think you're on your way, and it's so nice to hear you. It's funny too, a lot of the stuff you say are actually shows I worked on. So like I worked on Regis and Kelly, and I worked with Rosie O'Donnell, and I worked on Dancing with the Stars and American Idol. So it's it's so fun to hear those uh, those things, you know, be these things that were inspirations to you, because, uh, you know, I'm nearing 40, so I've been working in, like, in and out of the industry uh, for comics and movies and TV for a long time, and uh, and so it's so great to hear you say these things, and I'm like, wow, that's that's awesome that all that stuff, because those things were just jobs to me, you know, like, they, they were just like, I showed up, I did my, my job, I was like a grip and lighting guy for some of them, and some of them I was a production assistant, and and, uh, and I, I did my thing, and uh, and but to know that it was out there, you were watching and inspired, it's like, wow, maybe the the fates wanted us to uh, to meet at some point anyway, and it just it took us this long to get here. But I'm, I'm glad we did because you you make awesome stuff, dude, and it's it's clear it's a dream job for you. And I'm gl- I, and it's nice to hear people hit that dream. And that's what you know. That's some of the things I hope to accomplish on this podcast with the Parasite Podcast is find people out there who are, um, as Dan Harmon used to say, uh, kind of like uh, seeking out their bliss, you know, like the, the, the things that make them happy that uh, that they can do that doesn't hurt anybody and that helps them grow as people. It's so it's so amazing to hear you talk like this. Uh, and uh, it's it's inspiring, dude. It really is. And I like here's the thing. I like when I when you said those shows, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going there. Oh, my God. Wow. It is. My dad, Matthew, always said there's something with Bashar, which is it was meaning to happen. It was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. All, all the time. I, I There is definitely a plan for something. And I don't I don't know how we all fit into it. But moments like this make me realize, oh, yeah, that's right. We're we're kind of part of something. Um, but also, it, it seems like our paths were just destined to cross because we both are similar. Like we both are approaching journalism the best way we we feel like we can and we're both growing in a way that makes us both happy and that's and that's great to hear so so now that we've talked about you know your dream and the dream job and, and you pursuing all these amazing things let's go back to that nightmare <laughs> of, uh, of venom and and carn and the, the venom symbiote and the spider-man symbiote trying to pull at peter parker and swallow him whole like what it what is it about that scene that um that sticks with you in a in a kind of an a horrifying way because obviously it was a, a nightmare for Peter Parker but it turns out it's a nightmare for you too it's basically good and de- good and evil and when he and when the vet and it was like basically saying when you had the Spider-Man costume and the ven- and then the ven- and then Venom should be upholding and then Venom swallows a hole that's like terrifying it's like a battle of conscience and it's like basically it was like watching Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde battle and Hyde swallows Dr. Jekyll whole <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is, and there's definitely always been that aspect with Venom where it's like a, a Jekyll and Hyde thing, and uh, in a way, I mean, although Jekyll and Hyde, in this case, have very similar goals, uh, so there's not a lot of interpersonal fighting with them. I mean, they add it later, you know, where the, you know they keep somehow keep secrets from each other, the suit and 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 Eddie, um, but uh, but for the most part, yeah, there's there's a little bit of that in there, and so I can see that that sequence, by the way, is um, is an amazing sequence. It's a it's ripped right out of the comics too, which is fantastic. Yeah, and they made that suit look terrifying without the teeth and everything. <laughs> yeah, it did. It looked like a like a giant evil ghost or something. It was it was awesome. They did a fantastic job. And I, I don't know if you remember this in the '90s with the some of the Spider-Man comics around that time when the show came out, but some of them uh, they packaged them in poly bags. And they gave you an actual animation cell, like a replica animation cell from the Spider-Man cartoon. Did you ever have any of those? I did not, unfortunately, because the thing is, I was going back to Spider-Man and seeing that my very first Spider-Man issue that I actually got was its 350th issue because Doctor Doom was on the cover of it. And I wanted to see Spider-Man and Doctor Doom face off. Oh, that's amazing. I love those encounters. And Doctor Doom is my favorite villain of all time, actually. For me, it's, he's my favorite Marvel villain, but however, Joker always tops mine for DC. Okay, Joker, yeah, that, that's awesome. I, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, people always ask me, they're like, who's your favorite villain in comics? I go, Doctor Doom. They're like, well, why don't you do a Doctor Doom show? And I go, trust me, man, 
I will one day. <laughs> like for, for sure, I will. Just wait until you're sta- wait until you're established because once you're become because here's the thing. It's like with me with America with my reality shows when I cover. For example, I covered started covering American Idol during the tail end of the Fox season. Yeah. And like with season with season eleven, and then I decided, okay, Howard Stern's coming on America's Got Talent. Start on season season seven, and then work my way up. And like those, like even though I did not watch Idol. Even though I did not watch ABC Incarnation of Idol because of some reasons, I still kept on America's Got Talent. True, I'm like yeah, I noticed that there's some stuff like, for example, the Gabrielle Union controversy, mm-hmm. and like I understand that, but like I do not want to touch that because the thing is, I don't want to ruin a relationship that I've been building up because NBC has been very great. I've been very grateful because NBC has actually given me the entire last year, the, this year. Gave me all forty people that were competing on America's Got Talent Champion season two, access to all forty of them, including the winners and the runners up of that season. So I'm very, very grateful in building my relationship with NBC, with AGT's publicity department. I do not want to ruin anything. You know, it, it's it's interesting to hear you say that too, because uh, you know people have asked me that before. Like, uh, you know, would you? You know, I don't know. Like, they're like, would you ever talk about something controversial if you thought it would lead to? you know, people, um, you know, having an issue with you or ruining a relationship, like, like you said, like a business relationship. And I usually tell them, well, for the most part, I avoid covering that stuff for that reason. So I have the rule of like, yeah, we don't really cover leaks or rumors. And I also try not to make videos where I'm just, you know, just throwing shade at somebody. Like, it's like, yeah, I'm not a drama channel. I'm not one of those things. Like, I'm not trying to bring that attention to me. I like you, want to actually interview people who work on these shows and even if it's a show I don't you know like on some level or if it's a show I don't like you know I'm not a fan of the interpretation or whatever it is or there's characters on it I don't like or have an issue with I do know that that show means something to someone and that someone probably watches my content and I owe it to them as a content creator to bring them unique content like interviews and things like that with people and and uh, and so there is a business side of this so i know some people are like they they don't understand that they're like you know why do you cover this but you won't cover that and it's like or why won't you say this on your show and it's like look i'm always going to be honest if i'm critical i'm critical i don't i don't feel like i'm going to lose any you know support from like you know like a sony or like a, a marvel or anything like that like i mean sometimes marvel they get upset when you give them negative reviews but it's like hey i always try to include in my reviews this is my opinion Please tell me yours and let's have a conversation about it. And please still go buy the book yourself and make up your own mind. I feel like as long as you do that and you and you bring that to the table, you're not going to burn any bridges. But I hear what you're saying. And it's an important thing that I think the audience who's listening to this might need to hear is that we do sometimes have to walk a fine line if we want to get to certain places as a career. And both of you do, both you and I do want to make a career out of this. So, so we do have to straddle that line. Yeah. And like, here's the thing. Am I, it's, I have to be honest because I'm looking at right now, I'm being releasing in my music reviews for the first time in a, in a while, and I have to be honest. Like, I look, for example, there's Lady Gaga's Chromatica, and then there's also, I'm looking at the Florida Georgia line, and their music has gone down, has gone quality down. Because I've said, maybe because I've been honest with my reviews, I may have not have had the opportunity to go to, so, to like cover their big machine records. Or maybe, or like that. But however, for every loss, there's a gain because Epic Records. I'm very, very, very lucky to have Epic Records and all these other different and all these mom pa PR firms want me to come and interview their artists and have them feature them on my set on on Cheek Steak, and I'm very grateful for that. So just just as one door closes, another one will open. Absolutely, and uh, and like you said, it's like yeah, people. And but now that you've built an audience on getting that type of content why would you put that in jeopardy to prevent yourself from getting more of it? And so sometimes I see people go, oh, you're, you know, they'll come at me and they'll be like, oh, you're selling out, you're doing this. It's like, dude, I'm doing what I, I need to do and I'm being as honest as, as I am. Like, I'm always going to be honest with you guys, but I get, there are things I got to do because I want to progress this as a career. And same with you. It's like, yeah, if you want me to keep bringing you content, I'm going to need to 
to do things on this level and 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 be you know interact with people on this level in order to bring you that content and i think there's nothing wrong with people doing that especially because this is a business and because you and i treat it like a business and we're not just you know just plain fanboys online who are just talking out of our butts about stuff we do try to come up with interesting questions and find interesting guests and have you know interesting conversations that's that's part of our jobs now you know and we have to look at this as our jobs and careers absolutely and like the thing is i get i'm very lucky that i've had the opportunity to have some have some conversations that some of these people that i've interviewed i have some have blossomed some relationships and like when i see someone try to track that person like for example a lot of my friends are in the big brother challenge mtv world i'm like uh I'm trying to, I, I will on social media say, on, on Instagram say, look, I like you, like, please don't go after this person. I know you hate, don't like them, but you hate them as characters, not as people. I've gotten to know these people very well. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you, and you do. I mean, it, it sucks that we have to throw in that addendum like, hey, guys. I'm going to throw, you know, I'm, I'm going to be negative about something, but that is not an invitation to go attack somebody or, or, or because you hate them, you shouldn't use that as a reason to go attack them. Like, it's just, this is entertainment and that's all we're doing here is just talking about entertainment and, uh, and that's, you know, it's fine. You don't have, like, it, it's, it's so funny. I, I, someone yesterday was just telling me, they're like, oh, I, you know, I hate your video on this because I disagree with you. And I'm like, but I'm talking about a cartoon. Like, you know, it's like. Are, are you really going to be so mad? There's so many real world problems. You're going to hate me yeah. because I liked the cartoon episode that you didn't like. Uh, and I and I was able to explain why I liked it. Even, and it's like, fine, and, you, you, you disagree. That's okay. But like, do we really have to hate each other because we disagree? Absolutely. And, and look, I know, yeah, there have been moments I've taken some stuff too far. And I admit that on several acts on America's Got Talent because they've gotten more kids for towards last in a couple of years there have been some average kids have made it way farther than adults and yes i have had the opportunity yes i've clapped back on social media and i and yeah i've kind of i kind of got in tips with them however that's my opinion because i look because i'd rather see an adult having their dream come true after, especially after years sure. of doing that and like that's what I feel. That's why I feel. But however, seeing a kid getting the easy route and not like not doing that and not avoiding, like for example, if they go into if some of these young performers go into the, the mainstream world, these pe- these record labels and executives and TV executives are going to eat them alive like sharks. And if they can't handle a comment from me, then how are they going to handle them? Sure. Yeah. And like you said, it's 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 part of the industry you're in. It's part of the thing. But yeah, you're allowed to have your opinion and people are allowed to disagree. But, you know, again, it, it's like the stakes couldn't be lower. That's what I always tell people. I'm like, look, the stakes aren't like I like this cartoon. You don't. Did the world end? No, not at all. Did even a piece of cement crack or like a, a tree die? No, nothing got hurt by us having different opinions. So uh, so it's OK. We can we can still talk. And that's and, you know, and that's why I like having people and that's what this show is about too is bringing people on who have different opinions about whether it's venom and then they talk about their lives and they maybe talk a little bit about their lives and people disagree it's like it's okay like but we're all parasites in a way like and i say that as a term of endearment because we're venom fans uh but we are like the the motto of the show is we are venom so we're all in this together we're all friends and it's so great to just talk to another journalist who's pursuing a kind of a different avenue than I am, but still with a similar goal. It's so great. And to see you succeed is amazing. So Jacob, one, thanks for coming on the show. And two, can you please tell people again where they can find you? And and I'll put the links in the description below, but I just, you know, just to have them, have you say it one more time. All righty, guys. You can reach me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Jacob, J-A-C-O-B. E L Y A C H A R. Once again, J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. And then also, if you want to see what I've been up to, head to jakes take.com. Once again, it's jakes take.com. And also, I'm happy to announce that the Jake's Take with Jacob Elijah podcast can be found on four different platforms Apple Podcast, Google Podcast. Spreaker and Spotify. So just type in the Jake's Take with Jacob Alisher podcast and you'll be able to download my shows. That's awesome. Jacob, again, I, I can't thank you enough, man. Thanks for making the time to be here and being one of the first people that I could focus on with this new Parasite podcast. It meant a lot to me. 
Vic, every time, anytime, my friend, you're always welcome at my, you're always welcome to talk. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. And everyone, make sure you go check out Jacob's stuff and show some love for him down in the comments. If you have any questions, let us know down there. And of course, we'll be around to answer them. Thanks so much. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.